So um, my first introduction into Southeast Asian martial arts was with my first teacher, uh, Jerry Tan, who's uh, still in Camden, still in Tufnell Park. Uh, I was 11 years old. Uh, I um, was raised, my father was a uh, boxer. So I was raised, you know, practicing the basics in boxing, nothing great. Uh, and then I switched to, from boxing, I switched to Wing Chun. Uh, and the reason for me doing the martial arts was I was raised in Northwest 10 Stonebridge Park, which was an estate. It was a very, very big estate in Brent, London, and it was notoriously known for gangs. So, you know, like journey into school backwards and forwards daily was an event for me, you know, so fights were frequent all the time and being of Spanish origin, small, uh, I was fighting all the time, you know. My parents fought initially, they couldn't move because of the economics, this is where we lived. So, you know, my dad said, look, you're going to have to learn something. So I tried, I tried learning Wing Chun under Martin Roos, uh, who was a... Uh, teaching in Neesden uh, and then what happened and this is no disrespect to any art when I say this it just it didn't work for me on the street you know I was I was getting I was getting I was getting beaten up you know and I was trying to apply what I knew I'm not saying that Wing Chun doesn't work it could work for some people it didn't work for me so then I started that obviously birthed a quest in me I, I was l like looking to find something that really worked on the street I had no interest in doing martial arts anything other than just that just purely for self-defense, so that's what I went out. So I came across a teacher called Jerry Tan, and he was working in Carnaby Street in a Kung Fu shop, and I inquired there, and the owner of the shop said, actually, Mr. Sifu Tan does mantis, Kung Tao mantis. Uh, he's from Sumatra, which is Southeast Asia. So anyway, I was introduced to him. I started, I started training straight away. You know, I'd make the journey from Stonebridge to Tufnell Park. We trained in his house. It was a very closed door. It was full contact. You know, it was, you know, by the time I was 13, 14, I was fighting. You know, we were fighting full contact up and down the country. Uh, and the sparring was very, very, very real. Uh, and, you know, by the time I was 18, 19, I was helping running the school. And I became UK national full contact champion, you know. So, however, it, it left me with an emptiness. Uh, inside, you know, I thought, is this it in the martial arts? You know, I've got to a really good level. I can defend myself in the ring. What happens if this occurs? What if a blade occurs? And it's still probing questions inside. Uh, I, the, the, again, this may sound rather strange, but I had this, this burning desire that one day I'd meet a teacher. And in my, inner, in my inner kind of vision, I could see another motion and movement being birthed in me. I didn't know what it was. I had an experience at the UK National Finals whereby um, I slipped into what I know now as what the sports science called the zone. So I was able to win my fight open category quite easy. Right? But then again, that birthed deep questions. I thought there's got to be more in the martial arts. So I sat with my teacher, Jerry. He didn't really... He didn't really give me the answers I was looking for, you know, and so on my last fight, I just, I just said to him, Jerry, you know, we're in Chinatown eating. I said, I, th I think I've come to the end of my chapter. And he was very gracious. Okay, Steve, I completely understand. You're on a quest. You're on a journey. It's time for you to move on. So I had heard, um, I'd heard when you find a teacher, you fast for seven days. That's what the instructions that Jerry gave me. And it was a specific fast. It was with rice. The first day you take seven bowls of rice, then six, then five, four, three, two, one. So I did that. And on the last day, I had an impression of a female teacher. And I heard an inner voice say, go to Holland. So I did. I, I called my parents. I said, I'm off to Holland. I had no address. I took the train from the north to the south. My plan was to go to the south. I'd heard there was one teacher in the south who taught Silat, and the reason for Silat is Jerry had said to me, um, this was another ancient martial art in Indonesia, and he had, he had some knowledge of it already. So, and they do a lot with weapons, and that's what I was kind of looking to really sharpen my understanding of weapons. So anyway, I, I, I set off on this journey, um, and I was on this train early one morning, and suddenly I felt like someone hit me in Rotterdam. I had no address, nowhere to go. 
So I got off, I just got off, and I started walking towards the central part of Rotterdam. And my first place was a restaurant to try and find an Indonesian restaurant. I found one, and it was up these stairs. I walked up, and it was closed because it was around 9.35. So I thought, what next? So as I was walking down, there was a shop next to it that sold ornaments, uh, like Buddhist ornaments. And I walked in, and I inquired. I said, do you know anyone that teaches Sila? And the two ladies... Don't even, they didn't even know what it was. And as I was leaving the shop, one of the ladies was opening the post with one of those knife openers. And she ran out to me and said, look, here's a flyer. And it said, uh, Penjak Silat, School of Guru Ma, Ayurveda, and a list of things that she offered in her school. So I rang up. I, you know, I thought this has to be a sign. This is the first shop that I walked into. Do you know what I mean? It has to be. So I, I, you know, I rang the number and uh, Guru Ma got on the other line of the phone and said, yep, hello. I said, I'm a student from London. She said, I've been expecting you. I've told everyone that you were coming. So she gave me the address. I got on a cab, knocked on her door. She told me to wait outside. She left me waiting for about 25 minutes, which is a traditional way of checking to see if the student really wants to learn. After about yeah, 25 minutes, half an hour, she opened the door and she said to me, do you recognize me? And I said, Kind of, but not really. She sat me down, made me a coffee, introduced herself as Guru Ma, and as a Silat teacher, showed me her lineage, what I was required, and within an hour, I was in a garden training. You know, so that's how I met, and I stayed with her until 2012. That was that's that is how I met, came to Silat. Let's just look at how we apply the upper strike, very famous strike in Hari Mal. So. Let's go look. One, two. That so comes up here. And the reason it comes up is so it can go down. It's very easy. You feel that? Yeah. Very easy to bring someone down from there. So watch again. Up. You see that? Comes upwards and then comes down. So let's watch it. See it? So that. This becomes a strike upwards, a strike down, and a rip. Okay, very famous for in the Hari Mal. It's also applied this way. If you punch, it's going across. So you see, I'll do it slowly here, and then here, with the claw into the fingers, okay? It's also applied from this point here, here, to the temple. You can apply it this way, this way, this way, this way, and this way. So, Harimau using its palm. Okay? If you do it slowly, up, up, down, turn, turn, turn. So, you're using that palm of the hand. So the lanka that I used there was triangle step entry, up, down, you can use it double hand, like so. So using the palm of the hand. When you're, when you're changing in lolok, you can see my hand position. Punch is for grabbing. You see? Or that way. See how I'm grabbing. The grab becomes a pinch. Okay? Guru Ma was, she said to me straight away, she said to me, I'm not like any other teacher you'll ever know. She said, uh, please throw away what you've learned. I know that you've come already trained. I, I, was, I was ripped in those days, you know. I was... So she, the first thing she asked me to do, she said to me, to show me what you've learned. I did. Which was a blend of Sila and Kunta. It was a blend. You know, I did it as quickly as I could, and she looked at me and said, predictable, wouldn't work, too slow. And she just completely destroyed everything that I'd learned. She said, um, you know nothing about fighting. You know nothing about Bella Diri, self-defense. She says, you will learn from scratch. And I, to be honest with you, I was kind of like, okay, then you show me something. That was my attitude. 
So she said, tonight, this evening, we have a CLAC class, uh, and you will, I will introduce you to which were my first generation, her first generation students. So I waited around in her house. She drove me around. She cooked me lunch. Uh, and the first thing she taught me was a green leaf meditation. She said, your mind wavers too much. You can't central yourself. You don't know what real focus is, what real awareness is. And so she had me in her garden looking at a green leaf on a bowl of water for about two hours. After about two hours, she came back into the garden and she started showing me a flow of motion, which I'd never seen before. Very, very dance-like flow of motion. But I had no idea what it was, what it looked. To me, it looked rather flaky and flowery, to be honest. But because I was there and the nature of what happened, I stayed with it. That evening, however, I, was, I came into the school. It was in Nudsingle. It was in the red light district in those days in Holland. And she was giving a... Because Guru Ma would give lectures at 7 o'clock, esoteric lectures. So things on cosmology, numerology, astrology. It was a really thorough learning. So after about two hours of this lecture, which I took no notice, she said, OK, the Silak guys came in and the, the shutters opened and we went into this little room, which was about this size. And the Silak began. And to be honest, I was way out of my league. You know, I saw these Dutch guys, some Indonesian, some, there was only about six or seven. I was way out of my league. These guys were quicker, were faster. Were, I, I couldn't even work out the maneuvers that they were doing. Their footwork was, it was just different. And I, you know, we sparred, because sparring's a big part of Silat, so you're always sparring. And I was way out of my league. A lot of it was to do, they were 27, 28, okay? But there was a few guys in there that were just superior in technique, fluidity, motion, movement, everything. And that is what kept me at the school. It wasn't the, it was that that kept me. I thought, what they're doing is much better than what I have. And that is what I need to learn. So that's, then the training began. You know, I'd, we'd train Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Fridays. And then I'd train at her house with her. And then she sent me all over Indonesia. Trained with five different uh, masters. You know, until the day she died, 2012. Same technique, upper strike, sweep, take. We've done left over right, right over left. Now from here, I'm gonna take him backwards. So straight into kuching and open up. You see that? So I've got him in an open kuching. All right, so you're moving, you should be able to move to the right, to the left, and also opening backwards. Okay, so watch again. So from a lot of position, I can open in backwards, arm bar or neck take here. So you apply the neck break here. Okay, so that's moving left, right and backwards. Okay, so again, so step out, strike, strike, lolok. Left over right, turn, right over left. In any position, I can move back here, or if I'm in this lollop position, I can sepok back here, and I can apply a harimau break. You can see straight away, I can apply a harimau. So it doesn't need to be stepping, sometimes it's just with a twist. That is the first meditation she teaches. She teaches a number of meditation. That in the initial Sanskrit is called Samadhi. And Samadhi is a way of bringing concentration. So in Sila, concentration is male and awareness is female. Okay? So when you're aware of the room, so for example, in Sila, you're always in peripheral. If I was sparring with you, you would always be in peripheral. I'd be aware of your wife and I'd be aware of the camera. I'd be aware of the door at the same time. But to hold that, to hold that awareness takes concentration. So the green leaf meditation was because I had a very wavery mind. You know, it was very wavery. And so she said, this is no good for sparring. And she was right, because if you, when you're sparring, the moment you waver or fall asleep, you get hit. You know that, you know. And, and so that, she thought, the unification of all your energies was the first thing that I needed. So the green leaf is for the fun that function. Sup, sup, turn. Pin, break, break. You can see I'm using this. See, I'm using that nice control position. Again, strike, 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 turn, lock, break, break, 
open. Again. Break, break, open. See how I'm opening? Yeah, and then we finish in a kuching. See that, see that, look. So it, it, internal Chinese martial arts and internal sila are two different things, okay? Although people have said there's similarities. Of course, there has to be similarities, but when we say internal, internal is, according to Guru Mai, is learning how to use your holistic, complete energy. So, for example, learning how to use your awareness is internal. Learning how to use your body structure is internal. Learning how to use your tendons is internal. Learning how to use your intent is internal. Learning how to use your seven energy lines is internal. So internal means learning how to use everything that you are. It's not just, you know, just, okay, this is floppy, this is relaxed, this is internal. No, internal is a boxer can be internal. An MMA guy can be internal. That is really dependent on how much he understands of who he is. So the more you understand of who you are, what you have, you're not just muscle, right? and good technique, you're far more than that, that will determine what is internal to you. So that's really the question. Internal to me goes way, way, it goes into Naruni. And Naruni is something that we believe in Silat is in everyone, it's light. So for example, Naruni in nature is, you imagine a little bird that size and it has a little brain that size and yet when it develops a nest, it develops a nest with very, a very complex piece of architecture we say the Naruni, the natural instinct inside of that bird that blows through that bird, created that. So that is, Narun is something that we trust in. It's, in our, it's, it's cosmic intelligence. So you know, the, the Chinese use Qi. We say yes, we call it Tanaga Dalam, inner power. Right? So we say, bang, there's inner power, there's intent behind that. Of course the body has to be relaxed and so forth. But there is, we say that the Qi, the energy has cosmic intelligence. And in understanding that it has cosmic intelligence, then we understand that there is a language of chi. You know, and, and if you look at science now, you, you can go into very clearly that trees have information, the way that relate. So there is a language. There is a language that is out there. But it, it's not English. It's not human. So that's how far we go into understanding internal energy. And, um, you know... It's, uh, it's something, again, again, that I use every day. It's helped me every day.